Sky News. The full story first. Coming up, it's been 25 years since astronauts first arrived in the International Space Station. Proof that humanity can cooperate, at least when the gravity's switched off. So what has it achieved and who owns space now? The world is on the brink. Wars, contentious elections, disinformation, spreading at warp speed, and Donald Trump at the center of all of it. But what does it mean for the rest of us? Every week on Pod Save the World, Tommy Vitor and I cut through the noise to explain how global power is shifting. No jargon, no homework, just clear, honest conversations about what's happening and why it matters. From breaking news to long-simmering international conflicts, we dissect it all with critical analysis and some jokes that will surely embarrass our children one day. Tune in to Pod Save the World every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts, or catch it on YouTube. There is this kind of new element of a, a, a space race. Um, but I think we can also do it in a spirit of, of cooperation and collaboration. That's the whole spirit of, of exploration is, is, you know, yes, OK, we might be coming from different positions, but we're also, you know, one species and we're also there to cooperate and collaborate. If anyone knows a thing or two about space, it's Major Tim Peake, the first British astronaut at the European Space Agency and the sixth person born in the UK to reach the giddy heights of the International Space Station. 25 years since the first astronauts moved in, the ISS was a symbol of what humanity could achieve together. The United States and Russia, former enemies, sharing a tin can, a toilet and the bill. The Cold War was over, cooperation was in, and low Earth orbit briefly felt like the one place we might actually behave ourselves. Fast forward a quarter of a century and space looks less like a peace project and more like a business park. The ISS is approaching retirement just as a new space race takes off, not between superpowers, but between billionaires. Elon Musk wants to make us a multi-planetary species. Jeff Bezos wants to move heavy industry off Earth. Both insist they're saving humanity both happen to own the rockets. So, as the ISS prepares for its final descent after a quarter of a century of service, we're asking, what did this floating experiment in cooperation really achieve? And in the new era of private spaceflight, who actually owns the skies? Back on the podcast, our science correspondent, Thomas Moore. A quarter of a century of the ISS... This is a big old achievement, not just for one nation, but for the world. Yeah, it? it's, it's huge. I mean, it has been the orbiting laboratory for 25 years. In November 1998, they started building it. The Russians sent up the first module. The Americans sent up theirs soon after. And then bits have been added on uh, over the years. And the Europeans joined the party in 2008. And since the year 2000, it, it has been continually inhabited by astronauts. Teams have been going up there every six months or so on rotation from Russia, States, Canada, Japan, and of course Europe too, and our very own Tim Peake from the UK. It's just the international quality to the International Space Station that really sticks with me. 25 years of cooperation. And, you know, if you look out the window down at the planet from the ISS today, the world doesn't look like a very cooperative place. An engineering feat, for sure, to Mm. lift so much up into space and then astronauts leaving what was then the space shuttle to actually bolt this thing together. Sometimes the robotic arm, but Mm. there was no way around it. They had to go out into deep space. With a drill. Yeah, with a drill, with a toolbox. A drill and a Banner yeah, on the outside absolutely. Of the ISS. Yeah, right. but you're right. I think there has been this big shift. So whatever geopolitical tensions there have been on the ground between Western nations and Russia, primarily, we have overcome those in space, and there has been generally no problem. There's been a little bit more tension more recently mm. when a few holes were found in the the Russian module and some accusations that perhaps Western astronauts may have sabotaged it. That came to nothing. So what was the space station for then and now? always intended to be a a laboratory Mm. uh, where they would be able to do experiments on stuff. So new materials that they needed to study in microgravity. It's not quite zero gravity. Mm. Still, they are falling slowly. So they do have that small bit of gravity, but it's much less than down here on the Mm. planet's surface, of course. And that allows them to study things in different ways. So 
alloy metals, for example, mix in a slightly different way. So they can construct new materials, they can look at new pharmaceuticals, crystals wow. grow in a different way. But of course, the astronauts themselves have become lab rats. So they've learned an, awful, on, lot, an awful lot about how the human body survives in space, mm-hmm. the changes that go on. And there are really significant uh, changes that, that we have come to understand. Because, you know, when you go to the space station, you're not there for a long weekend. You're there for an extended period of time. Yeah, Tim Peake put it like this, British astronaut. You age 20 years Mm, in in a matter of months. That's the bone loss, the muscle loss, what it does to your your DNA and all this kind of stuff. A lot of that is reversible once you come back down on the ground. Not all of it. And this is an ongoing challenge for people who are studying these astronauts. But if you're losing such a significant amount of your muscle mass, your muscle strength, that means that if we are going on to another planet, which is the next stage of human exploration... Are they going to be fit enough to bounce around on those spacesuits? If they have been travelling, for example, to Mars, it would take six to nine months. Now, that's why this has been such a, a really valuable learning experience on the ISS, because they've learned how to, to mitigate some of these effects. So the astronauts will exercise for two hours a day. That's the effort they have to put in to try and stop the the loss of muscle to keep their bones as strong as they can and so on. So this is a really, really important part of of living in space. It almost sounds like we are, metaphorically, figuratively speaking, using the ISS as a springboard for future space exploration. Yeah, I don't think that was the original intention. No, I think it genuinely was that it was a laboratory for understanding how things behaved in space including the human body. But now that we have become more ambitious, partly because space launches have become much cheaper, exploration has become much more feasible, that we have learned all these things that will help us to leap onto the next stage. What is life like on the ISS from those that you've spoken to? I think all of us remember Commander Chris Hadfield, the Canadian astronaut, strumming his guitar in the cupola, <laughs> uh, playing, what was it? It was David Bowie, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Look, They aren't having fun most of the time. They obviously have some time off to play the guitar or do whatever they want to do. A lot of them spend, understandably, a lot of time at the huge window just looking down on planet Earth and that has a transformational effect on their minds. But they are doing an awful lot of work. The experiments, Tim Peake, for example, did more than 250 different experiments in in his 186 days. They have a whole day set aside for maintenance and and hoovering. Why why would that be important? Got to keep it tidy. There is a lot of detritus that can get kicked up. The dust floats around and they need to try and keep down that dust. Plus plus you've got, got, you know, several people living in a tin can, which I imagine brings with it its own problem. There is a unique smell, for sure. (laughs) In fact, there are unique bacteria on the International Space Station because it has been an environment which has been isolated Mm -hmm. from Earth for so long. Bacteria that get trapped up there continue to evolve. They have evolved in a different way to those on Earth, which is really interesting, and it just tells you a little bit about the conditions on the ISS. They don't have a shower on there. They use wipes and that kind of stuff. They clearly have a toilet. Everything is recycled. The liquid is drunk again, which appalls some people, but that's what you have to do because it's so expensive to take fresh supplies up there. So they have to look at this stuff really carefully, preserve everything that they can, and then the rest goes out the hatch into deep space. I have to admit, I was rather more worried about the prospect of mutated space bacteria coming here and taking over the planet, but which could, I suppose, happen in the not-too-distant future because... The ISS is coming down. Yes, and in 2030 it's due to be deorbited and they will basically send up a rocket, will act as a tug, and that will nudge it into the atmosphere where it will break up. Now, they were aiming to, to do that in a very controlled way. They anticipate that it will come down at what they call Point Nemo. That's in the South Pacific Ocean, the furthest from land possible, and that's where most satellites do come down. Mm-hmm. So that's where it's almost certainly going to be its graveyard. What rep- places it? There'll be private labs. So this is very much the direction of travel, Mm -hmm. not just for NASA, but other agencies too, is that private companies are rapidly acquiring the skills and the technology they need to do it much cheaper. Mm. And this has been what NASA has been trying to do. We've already seen private companies landing on the moon. Once that was only possible for space agencies, national space agencies, but individual companies are doing it too now successfully. And that's been a big shift. And that will continue. So 
f- at least four different private companies are looking to launch labs into orbit in the very, very near future, some possibly next year. They will be private astronauts on contract for mm-hmm. companies, but also for space agencies. Is that entirely positive? Do you think taking away from the kind of the, the more, rather more democratic ISS, I say democratic with the Russians on board, but putting it into private hands feels to me slightly dangerous? Well, I think we've seen that trend now on planet Earth mm. with a lot more power going to big tech companies and therefore in the hands of individuals. We heard from uh, the new head of the UK security service warning about the impact that technology companies, a very small number of them, uh, were now having. Well, let, let, let's name some of the names. Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. I mean, they'd remain absolutely key players in this business. Oh, Elon Musk is out in front by of course, yeah. a long, long way. I mean, if you look at the number of space launches, SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk's company, looks like it will have 170 space launches, rocket launches this year. That's almost one every two days. Wow. Which is incredible. There have been 266 launch attempts this year from planet Earth. And if he's had 170 of those, you can see how he has quickly dominated access to space. Mm. And there's a very clear reason why. He does it cheaper than anywhere else. He set his engine is the goal of not only getting up to space, but then bringing back down the booster, the most Mm. expensive part of a rocket, and reusing it. And so he has brought down the launch costs to about, what, $2,500 per kilogram? Just a few years ago, it was three times that. Uh, And, you know, it's coming down. If you prepare to do what they call a ride share, Mm. that's effectively taking the bus to space rather than a taxi. You're going up with a lot of other satellites. You can only get off in certain orbits, like a bus, but you can actually get up there for about a thousand dollars a kilogram it's dirt cheap and that's opened up wow. huge possibilities not just for elon musk with his starlink satellites he's got about nine thousand broadband satellites up there already he's hoping to have another what, 30 maybe even forty thousand in the coming years and that will bring broadband to parts of the planet that have got no access to at the moment so transformational people on the ground and it's allowing us to do all kinds of stuff but there's a lot of power in the hands of one man so i think we should celebrate the fact that jeff bezos managed to get his rocket the new glenn up in the air and then back down on the ground very recently. That was a test flight, first time that he's done it. So there could be some competition. It would mean there would be two cheap routes to space, and I think competition is always a good thing. Just talk, though, about the ideology of both of them, because I think they come at space rather differently. You listen to Elon Musk, and yes, there is all the corporate aspect of it that you've just been discussing, but it seems to me he's rather keener on seeding humanity on Mars, whereas you look at Jeff Bezos, the Amazon background, and he's talking about taking industry up into space. Yes, and I, th- I think you're right. You're absolutely right, and both are possible. I think the, the designs of the rocket are, are slightly different, and in theory, Jeff Bezos's rocket, the New Glenn, is much broader mm. and could take up bigger payloads. So if you're looking at things like solar farms in space, well, that could certainly go up in Jeff Bezos's rocket. Mining asteroids. Yeah, potentially so. Everything is, is possible. But you're right, Elon Musk has very firm ambitions to get to Mars, as possibly sending uncrewed rockets next year and he's talked about a self-sustaining city of a million people on the red planet by mid-century i mean really ambitious stuff but would you describe what we are in right now then as a space race and the way in which it was the united states and the old soviet union back in the day because of course you do have the corporate actors in all of this but the united states through nasa is still pretty powerful china india Also, they have designs on space, and in particular the moon. The nature of the space race has changed. So first of all, you've got private companies involved now, so they're in this race as well. But if you look at the flag carriers, primarily the United States and China, I think those are the two big players looking to go back to the moon. Both want to do it by 2030. NASA says they'll do it within this Trump administration, so that's possibly sooner. They are flying next year astronauts around the moon looking to land in 2027, but that hinges on SpaceX being ready with its starship. And at the moment, that development has been a long way behind, which is why NASA's chief has thrown open the competition and said, well, we might actually let Bezos's company in to do the final be the final trip down onto the lunar surface. That is up in the air. So some people doubt whether NASA will land in 2027. It'll get very tight with the Chinese to get down on the surface. There is that kind of geopolitical 
we planted our flag here first. And they're going for the South Pole. Mm -hmm. And there's a very good reason here. Back in the Apollo days, mm -hmm. they landed on the nice flat plains, mid-moon, the bit that we see. Mm -hmm. They're now going for the South Pole because they're looking for frozen water, ice. Down there in those very deep craters, which get no sunlight, the temperature has been well below zero for centuries, millions of years. And so there is probably an awful lot of water ice down there. Now, with ice, you can obviously melt it for water. You can raise it to higher temperatures and it turns to a gas, H2O. That means you have oxygen to breathe and you also have the elements of rocket fuel. So you could, in theory, use the moon as a staging post to going on to Mars and the rest of the solar system. That's why people are so keen on getting back there. It is incredible, notwithstanding the obvious geopolitical significance of being a nation, to stick your flag in yeah. the moon. We were talking before we started recording about the Apollo missions and those moon landings. It was a hugely significant moment for the world, I thought. And we are lacking those in the 21st century. There, there aren't big events that we as a global community can all cast our eyes on, apart from sport maybe, other than space exploration. And I just wonder, in this push to going back to the moon, whether there is something really positive, just in and of itself, of having humanity standing on that thing that we can look out our windows at night and see. I think that's right. Yes, the moon is something every human on the planet has seen. And to know that there are people up there takes us away into the vast inky blackness of the night. And if you can get to the moon, could you get to the stars? And I think that's the unknown at the moment. We certainly don't have the technology to do that at the moment. But Musk does talk about the need for a second spot in the solar system where there is humanity, just in case stuff happens on Earth and you know, there's all kinds of things that could go wrong down here, so we need a plan B. People have always questioned the utility of space exploration and the amount of money that we spend on it. When you've got people talking like Jeff Bezos about mining asteroids and you've got Elon Musk talking about setting up another community of humanity on Mars because Earth might die at some stage, it doesn't sound horribly positive. It sounds incredibly corporate and possibly even slightly self-serving. Yes, and I suppose that's the inevitable consequence of companies becoming involved. Mm. So there isn't space agency, which is funded by governments, and governments are elected by the people. And so there is a kind of a public ownership of uh, space exploration in the past. Perhaps mm. we have less control in the future. And if a private company goes to the moon, do they have the mining rights? There are laws that apply to asteroids, to the moon, to all these things. They can't be owned. We all own them. There's that common ownership. And uh, that's the principle of space law. But these things can be eroded in the future. We wouldn't say that things now can't be undone in the future. Is there no capacity for cooperation when it comes to space? I mean, the United States and China, the two superpowers in the world at the moment, both have designs on what lies beyond. Can't those two work together? China is the only country that the United States will not cooperate with. Mm. So they are not part of the ISS. They have their own orbiting laboratory. So the Chinese are in competition with the Western nations. Mm. I spoke to Tim Peake about this, mm. and he said we have to be slightly careful about how strong we go at a space race. There has to be cooperation and collaboration because it is hazardous exploring the moon. It would be foolish to use his word not to have common hatches that can latch on to each other between people going to the moon because you never know something might go wrong. We may have to rescue Chinese astronauts and vice versa. Let's finish where we began M. Thomas and with the ISS. Have you ever watched it going overhead? Because I started doing so during the COVID period. Dead at night staring up at the scars, and this star, this really bright point in the sky, shoots over your head. You have seen it so many times. It is absolutely mesmerising. It is so bright, mm -hmm. uh, growing across the sky. One Christmas Eve, it went over. My kids were little, <laughs> and it was so easy to fool them that this was Santa. It was absolutely fantastic. Thomas, <laughs> always great to have you on the podcast. Thanks again. Pleasure. That's your lot for today. You can read Thomas's thoughts on 25 years of the ISS over on the website, skynews.com. The Daily's back again tomorrow. Hey, it's Sophie and Will from Sky News. Too many headlines, too little time. We get it, and that's why we're bringing you Cheat Sheet. Ten minutes every weekday morning. All the big stories from politics to pop culture, minus the noise. No doom scrolling, no spin 
just the stories that matter from two people who live and breathe the news. Cheat Sheet with Bridge and Frost from Sky News. Follow Cheat Sheet wherever you get your podcasts.